Hey, welcome. It's great to have you here for this guided meditation and Dharma talk. My name is Jonathan Faust. I'm very grateful for you making the time to be here. Um, as you might be able to see, uh, I'm not in my usual location, um, on the road, and um, here to treat you to the great image of the uh, puppies in the background. Um, before we begin, uh, a couple acknowledgements. First of all, a big thank you to our Mindful Movement teacher for today and to the Mindful Dialogue leaders afterward. Uh, the whole smorgasbord experience uh, here on Monday night, Eastern Standard Time, at 6.30, if you'd like to join the um, Mindful Movement, please feel free. These are great teachers. It'll be either Rita or Lynn or Anna. That takes you to about 7.20, 7.25, which prepares you for the meditation, which is right now. And that goes on for about half an hour. At 8 is the Dharma talk, and then after the talk, we end at 8.45 Eastern Standard. A few minutes after, you can join Mindful Dialogue with uh, Ray Maniocchi and Tara Cassidy. Those links are on my website and on my Facebook page. So it's a great way to connect in this time of feeling more and more isolated. Also, a big thank you to Glenn Harrison and Leo Gimo for producing this evening. And a big thank you to the Insight Meditation Community of Washington for hosting this class and to my friends at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Arlington, which has been the physical home of Monday Night Meditation for many years and perhaps one day shall be again. I do have a mailing list if you look if you'd like some resources for your practice. I share a summary of talks and those links. If you can't uh, keep up with them all, it's a lot. And uh, my, phot my photography as well. Um, so you can sign up on my email list on my website uh, as well. The standard thank you for your support. Um, this is all offered in the spirit of generosity. So no one is denied access to these teachings. And these days, more and more, we need access to these teachings. So thank you for your support to make that happen. Um, let's see. One final thing. I'm going to be leading a half day coming up September in September um, on navigating change. So if you've got any change going on in your life, you might find this three-hour immersion uh, helpful. You can check my website. You can check Facebook there as well. Mostly, I'm just really, really grateful to have this time to practice together. In the talk um, after this meditation, we're going to be exploring the how the wounds in your life can be your gifts to the world. It's all part of this practice in mindfulness of turning attention toward, toward the unpleasant. It's about actually training yourself to look at what's between you and feeling free, what's between you and feeling happy, and some of the strategies for, for tuning into that. So we'll explore some of that in this meditation. Uh, you may be familiar with the practice of RAIN, to, to R, to recognize or realize what's happening. The A is to sense if you can allow or make room for it or say yes to it in some way. The I is to investigate, to, to look closely at how it lives on the inside, how it, how it lives in your thoughts and your beliefs. And the N is to explore what it means to, to, to nourish or nurture what you find there, to hold it in loving presence. And then after the rain, to sort of be with, be with anything that may have shifted over that time. So for this meditation, we're going to take some time to settle, to gather, to arrive, and then we'll take some time only if it's right for you. You can feel free to ignore me at any time. I'm sure you have if you meditate with me in the past. But I'm inviting you to explore something that might be kind of pre um, present in your life that you might like to learn a little bit more about. So as you're ready, you might like to reach your arms up overhead, stretch up to the left side, the right side, let out any sounds, let yourself begin to settle in. You can close your eyes. Sometimes it's helpful to let your, just let your body sway a little bit from right to left. Find that midpoint where you naturally want to come into stillness. You might also let your body just sort of drift forward and back a little bit. Can you align align your spine in a way that supports you in being alert and at the same time relaxed. And you might like to now bring your attention 
to your breathing. Notice where you feel the breath on the inside right now. And just sense if you can just feel the natural, natural inflow and outflow. And as you're ready, let yourself begin to lengthen the inhalation a little bit. Lengthen the exhalation. We'll do a few minutes of willful breathing as a way of gathering attention. So if you like, you can inhale to the count of four or five. On the exhalation, exhale again to the count of four or five. And for the next minute or so, match the length of the in-breath with the length of the out-breath. And as you breathe, notice how intimately you can feel the breath on the inside. You might notice as you bring your attention again and again back to the, this willful movement of the breath, you might begin to sense how you're a little more and more here in the present moment. Concentrated and present. And now for the next three breaths, again, breathing in to the count of four or five or exhaling to the count of four or five, Notice how intimately you can feel from the inside. And in your own time, you can release any control of the breath. You might just feel the imprint. And sense if it's possible to continue that sense of, of attention to wherever you feel the breath the most predominant on the inside. And you might inquire right now, what exactly is happening? Can, can you name what's happening inside? And the second question, can you let it be? Can you allow this to be as it is? We'll be returning to this elemental inquiry, but for now, let's move a little bit deeper into relaxed, embodied, awake presence. Relax or soften the inside of your mouth and your tongue. And imagine a sense of relaxation spreading through the muscles of your face, into the jaw, Softening the muscles around the eyes and, and radiating up into the forehead. Feel the forehead smooth. And sense the crown of the head and the back of the head, and the base of the skull. And feel now the, the weight and the heaviness of your arms. 
You might imagine your arms like heavy drapes hanging from the shoulders and let your awareness gently flow down, down through the elbows, sensing from the inside, flowing down through the wrists, awareness flooding into the palms, the backs of the hands, fingers and thumbs. Sensing now the lungs and the heart. And the diaphragm and the rib cage. And over the next three breaths, you might let your attention rest in the belly or slightly below the navel and soften and feel. Sensing the lower back and the buttocks, the floor of the pelvis, and the hip joints. And sensing now as well the, the movement from the hips down to the knees, sensing from the inside. The knees down through the ankles. The tops of the feet and the toes. And again, sensing from the inside, the soles of the feet and the heels. You might again now sense the movement of the breath on the inside. Or if you wish, use the anchor of sound or the anchor of the feeling in the palms of the hands. And imagine yourself as the witness, as the observer. Moment to moment, relaxed alertness. And the mind wanders as it naturally will. Notice how gently you can return your attention back to the sense of the breath, or sound or feeling. You might inquire again right now, what is happening? Can you name what's present in a word or two? And again, can you allow this to be here just as it is?
I'll be offering an inquiry into this practice of rain. And if these words don't resonate for you, you might just simply stay with the breath. Let, let my voice fade into the background. But if you'd like to explore where these questions take you, please feel free. And you might sense now if there's anything in your life that's between you and feeling happy, feeling free, feeling at peace. An interesting question can be, what would you say are the top three stressors in your life right now? And you might elect to reflect on one, bringing one into the foreground. And you might inquire, does it feel okay to be with it? And ask inside, look for a feeling tone. If it feels like it's too much, let it know another time you can be with it. If it feels like you might be with this a little bit more to explore it a little more in depth, then we can continue. When you think about this issue in your life, You might first explore what it's like if you imagine it, if you can replay it visually. Can you pick out a particular scene that's representative of this issue in your life? Or if it's a particular feeling inside right now, maybe some physical pain, just sense if you can get any visual cues. Is there anything about this particular issue that, that you associate with any sounds? Are there, are there, if this is relational, are there any words or tone of voice that are significant? Any words or like an internal sound as you reflect on it? And having this sense of how this might be represented visually and through the auditory channel, now take some time to sense as you reflect on this issue. What does it feel like inside? Can you relax and soften and feel down to the midline and get a sense of how this lives on the inside. If you were to find some words to describe it to a friend, what words would you use to describe the location of the feeling and the quality of the feeling? allowing yourself to respond freely to any of the following questions or to let them simply glide by. Is there an emotional word that resonates with this feeling inside? And this feeling inside, is there a sense of how old this is? Can you trace this feeling back into your history? Is there a sense of what you're believing as you feel this? Is there some core belief you might discern? And 
If at any time this feels like it's too much or it's not resonating for you, feel free just to let this go and move back to your meditation practice. But you might again, if you like, to continue on. And sense again, what words would you use to describe how this issue is present inside in the nervous system right now. And can you be with it? You might sense as if you were just sitting on a park bench together. What it's like to be with it. Sensing what it's like just to get familiar with this, not to figure it out or to make it go away. And now, if you could imagine this feeling inside or this, this felt sense, if you could imagine its point of view, sensing if it has a strong emotion, Is there a sense of, of how it wants you to be with it right now? Or a sense of what it needs? And you might, only if this feels right for you, you might bring your hand gently to wherever you feel this the most predominant side or bring your hand to your heart and breathe. And sense what it's like in your own way to open into loving presence, kindness, empathy, compassion. And if you were to hold this in some kind of loving presence, how does it move? How does it shift? How does it change? You might again just revisit this particular issue that you started with and sense in any way has it moved or changed. And you might explore what it's like to drop all technique and just sense what it's like just to be with this. You might just sense who you are without this imprint. And in these remaining five minutes or so, you might again notice where you feel the breath on the inside. And over the next three exhalations, how much more can you soften, relax, and let be? How much can you relax, relaxing the tongue, the palms of the hands, and the belly, the soles of the feet and the heels. Relaxed and alert. And you might, if you like, let, let your anchor fall away and sense for yourself what it's like to simply rest in presence. And 
Noticing what's changing, what's shifting. Exploring what it means to let be, to allow. Is there anything right now that could relax or soften or let go? Is there anything that could relax or soften or let go even more right now? In this remaining minute, you might very gently lengthen the in-breath just a little bit. Relax on the out-breath. As I breathe in, I'm aware of breathing in. As I breathe out, I'm aware of breathing out. And sensing all that is moving and shifting in your experience. And sensing that which is aware, that quality of knowing presence. And you might like to let your head drift a little bit to the left, to the right. Let your body begin to move stretch in any way that feels good for you and taking this time for your transition. If you like, you can reach your arms up overhead once again. Let out any sounds. Ugh. And welcome. There's a comedian I saw a long time ago. I wish I'd tried to find out who this guy was um, so I could actually credit him. But he was, you know, doing his normal comedian thing. And he said, you know, everyone, well, hey, uh, I'm... Um, I'm a father, I'm a new father, and you know, everyone clapped in their own way. And he said, and, and one thing I realized is I am, I'm committed to be a real jerk to this guy. Puzzlement in the air. And he said, you know, I, when I read about 
Steve Jobs, Larry Page, all these captains of industry, they all had terrible fathers and they had terrible lives. And I don't want my kid just to be some, some happy run of the mill person. So I'm gonna be a particularly nasty father. There's a paradox in there. Uh, it is true that so many, uh, so many accomplished people have had kind of traumatic pasts. And it opens up this really interesting paradox of how, how is it that some people with the deepest wounds <laughs> develop kind of these superpowers in life? What I'd like to talk about, and this is a topic that's a really, I, I find myself fascinated by this, is about this whole idea of how wounds can become gifts. The sacred wound, the sacred gift. We, we grow through adversity. And if we don't learn, we stagnate. I'd like to tease that out a little bit. And second, I'd like to talk about how amazing things can happen when you turn toward the wound. And of course, this is a big part of meditation practice, is, is learning how to get comfortable with discomfort. But also, beyond just how identifying your own wounds and holding them in loving presence can be fascinating, how as you become aware of the wounds in others, it can dramatically transform your relationships. And how when it comes to awakening, the wounds are considered the sacred gifts. They're the grist that, that brings us more and more alive. So a little bit about the wounds and adversity and the stories we tell ourselves. I remember as a kid uh, in holidays, you know, being with families and being in the kids' table next to the uh, the adults' table at Thanksgiving and Christmas. And, and I remember how every every holiday gathering, the old older folks, <laughs> I'm now one of them, would tell the same stories and be the same inflection every year. I remember the time when my father was hunting with his cousin and same story, same inflections, same dramatic pauses, and the same commentaries from everyone around. The same thing. Now there's something about that, which is really kind of interesting. I think it's actually part of the ritual of a, of a clan. You, you have the stories of the lineage that get repeated again and again. Then you have the Greek chorus reinforcing kind of the family narrative. Um, there's something very powerful about that. It's how we have our identity, how we feel like we're part of something. But I remember thinking as a kid, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to be telling the same story over and over and over again. Um, I don't want to be the person where we've been thinking, oh God, there he goes again. Of course, I have this, uh, this challenge of giving a talk almost every week, really trying not to repeat myself. Uh, I certainly do, but I try to give you a head up, a heads up when I share um, a joke that I really, really like. I try to keep it at once a year. But I think what I want to what I want to get across is how how we calcify around our stories. Uh, our stories lock us in, and they're they're good, positive, reinforcing stories, and then the, the stories that sort of keep us in low self esteem. In the same way as we calcify around our stories, we can calcify around our wounds. And I'm really stunned at how this process of transforming our wounds into gifts. So speaking of stories and old people telling stories, my, my grandfather on my mother's side, he was actually not a big storyteller. He was a very, very quiet guy. And this is this kind of blows me away. His father, my great grandfather, was a paid German mercenary in the Civil War. In the Civil War, um, he left. Um, he was the oldest child in a Catholic family, destined to go into the priesthood. He thought, no way. He left. Came to the came to the states. Um, picked up the only job he could, which was being a mercenary, and he was wounded in the war. Um, he did, after the war, um, got married, had a whole bunch of kids on a small farm in southern Illinois, and then he died of his, of his war wounds. My grandfather was born in extreme poverty, spoke only German, um, 
At five years old, he was kind of given to a neighbor where he lived in the barn, watching the cows in exchange uh, for food. And somehow, this guy learned English, went to school, put himself through college, put himself through engineering school, started a family very, very late in his life, um, in his 50s. And at one point, he was in charge of all the power for the first tunnel made under a river. Quite an accomplished dude. And I have to ask myself, if, if that was me, would I have had the gumption? Or would I have just been resentful of the cards that I was dealt in life? I think it's safe to say we all have, we all have wounds. We all have challenges. And do you not know anyone who has not felt betrayed at some point in their life? Someone who was hurt, someone who was belittled, someone who was caught in doubt. I think every one of us, again, encounters wounds along the way of life. And, and it's interesting how when you look at the steps that go into the, the physical healing of wounds, first you've got the bleeding. So the wound cuts, it sears, the blood is flowing, and then the clotting process begins. It closes the wound to kind of stop the bleeding. The blood vessels narrow. The platelets close to plug the wound. And then there's a protein that's generated by the body called fibrin, which is kind of a glue that holds that platelet plug in place. And then the process of rebuilding begins. And then the process of strengthening. And in that same way, just as quite often when, when you have a broken bone, sometimes because of, the, because of the healing of the wound, it's actually stronger than the bone. And when you feel cartilage or you know, around, around a cut, it's actually stronger than it was before. So our wounds actually can, can make us stronger. And there's this very, very cool um, discipline, practice, art called um, kintsugi from Japan. And uh, that word translates as golden joiner. And it's a process of taking pottery and repairing it with gold. And, and this is a really beautiful process of taking broken pottery and treating the breakage and repair as part of the history of the object. So rather than trying to disguise the wound, it actually, it actually honors it and, and actually makes those, those cracks and breaks stronger. It's beautiful stuff. Google it. It is some of the most beautiful pottery out there really honoring the, the brokenness and the coming together again into a greater sense of, of wholeness. So, so what does honoring the breakage mean for us? Like really honoring the breakage. This summer, I spent some time in New England. And when we were traveling back from New England, we stopped in to see uh, a good friend of mine. I'll call him David. Uh, because that's his real name. <laughs> he's one of the one of the feistiest, passionate, and funny people I know, and he's had this he's had this amazing career. Uh, for many years, he was head of global digital for a major corporation. He started his own creative company from scratch. Now he manages about half a billion dollars with four hundred people who report to him. He's also taught a course in business at NYU for twenty years serves on a number of boards as head of finance. And when we were having dinner, um, kind of looking around his house, he showed me his, his workstation, a tiny little iMac on a tiny little desk. <laughs> and I said, what? You do, you do your work on this? He said, yeah. He said, what are, all, I, all I really use is the, you know, is, uh, Zoom, you know, for the meetings and uh, teleconferencing and stuff like that. And he said, I don't take notes and I don't do email. So I asked him about this because I was really intrigued. And he said, he told me about how when he was about 50, he was watching an HBO special on dyslexia and ADD. And he started rattling off what it's like to have dyslexia and ADD. And he's like, oh my God, that's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. 
and he went on to tell me about his past. In high school, he never read one book. He barely graduated from high school, and he got into the only school that would accept him, kind of a, a lower-tier college. At some point, he realized that he really needed to focus if he was going to get anywhere, and he got his, his BA, and he, he got his MBA, and then this amazing career took off, a, a, an international career working with real, real industry global heavy hitters. And the question is, like, how could a guy with severe ADD and severe dyslexia be so successful in the world? And he said, well, I learned really early to surround myself with detail-oriented people. And he told me how when he gives presentations, and he gives a lot of presentations to, to boards, fundraising, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it's all from memory. All of, the, all of his presentations and notes are, are memorized. And he's developed a very, very strong memory so that when he meets with people who report to him, he doesn't write it down, but he remembers all the details. And so because he's not on the page, he's there eyeball to eyeball. And from everything I can tell, he's an amazing person to work for. I, I, I use this line, and if you've ever done a retreat with me, chances are I've used this line, where at the beginning of a retreat, I'll often ask, who was an A student? And I'll ask for a raise of hands, or, or who wanted to be an A student? A fair number of people put their hands up, and then I, I say this. Do you remember how much fun the C students had in school? The whole idea here is to let yourself be a C student, you know, just, just show up and, and see, see what resonates, see what works for you, rather than being tight around perfection. After sharing this in one of, my, one of my presentations way back when, there was this international consultant who came up and he said, you know, that, that's a great line. But he said, the truth is, A students work for C students. And that really intrigued me. And when I think of my friend David, who was a, he wasn't even a C student. He developed other skills that came out of his, out of his disabilities. There's a woman by the name of Helen Palmer. She's written a number of books on the Enneagram, really one of the, one of the first people to kind of codify the Enneagram into the written word. Um, uh, amazing, amazing woman. Um, and her background is fascinating. For, for many years, she was voted the best intuitive or the best psychic in San Francisco or the San Francisco area, I believe. And she noted something that I found quite impactful. A little bit on her background. She grew up in a very, very um, erratic and scary household with a lot of alcoholism. And she's noted that some of the most powerful intuitives grew up in some of the most erratic and scary households. Because as a child, they could tell by the way the car door was slammed, whether they were going to be yelled at or hit that night. So they had this, they, they developed this superpower of this radar where they could take all kinds of subtle information and interpret it that became a power that they were able to use in other ways. So it kind of came from the wound, but it also developed something in their, in their psyche, if you will. So this opens up a really interesting exploration. And one way to look at it is, what do you do really well? What would you say are, are your skills? What is kind of the formula you use for being successful in life or, or maybe even just getting by in life? And then the question is, is that tied into some wound in some way, some, some self-protective mechanism? And we'll explore this a little bit more in a few minutes. 
Generally, what happens is from our wound, we find some way to survive. And then that survival method becomes a way that we become successful or a way that we navigate our way through life, depending on how you define success. And so I, I find myself wondering, like, what are the consequences of not looking at those wounds? And I, when I think of Mahatma Gandhi, when he was tossed from the train because of the color of his skin, what if he had just skulked off and sort of stayed stuck in his woundedness and kind of played it safe in life? He took that moment to rally himself and to create a global movement. When I think of Nelson Mandela, stuck in jail for all those years, what would have happened if he simply stayed stuck in those cycles of hatred for his mistreatment? Somehow, and I don't know how, he was able to convert that horrific experience into something that changed lives around the planet. So wounds are part of the lifelong journey. No, no question about it. It's part of being alive. Acknowledging the wounds can be very, very helpful. And if you start to meditate, if you start to slow down, relax, pay attention, you begin to notice what's between you and feeling free. You begin to notice what's between you and feeling happy. It's inevitable, an inevitable part of knowing who you truly are. So this practice of RAIN is very, very helpful. There's two essential questions. What exactly is happening right now? And can I be with it? Can I allow this? And learning to use this power of investigation is so, so helpful. When you find yourself caught, small, tight, congested, to ask yourself, what is this? Is there, is there an emotion here? What is this wanting me to know? Is there a sense of how old this is? Is there a sense of how this wants me to be with it right now? That inner listening and then opening into loving presence to really explore what it's like to bring compassion, to, be, to bring kindness, to bring empathy to those wounded places inside opens up some cool possibilities. If we don't, most of our life is simply looking for evidence to prove our wounded perspective is right. You don't have to look very far. If you know anyone who is outrage waiting to happen or rejection waiting to happen or not belonging waiting to happen, those are part of the expression of our wound, which is quite often just below the surface, part of our unconscious, if you will. And much of what this journey is all about, Carl Jung put it really succinctly, making the unconscious conscious. As you relax, as you pay attention, inevitably, anything between you and feeling free is going to come to the surface. And the question becomes, when it does, how do you be with it skillfully? So the bad news is that it takes courage to sit in this process. The good news is there are multiple opportunities to practice. <laughs> Taking time to really get a sense of 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 the wounds is really really helpful now it's it's helpful to really get a sense of the conditioning to really understand the kind of the biography and this is where a lot of therapy can be really really helpful or a a, a, a process of mindfulness that begins to kind of reveal all the different causes and conditions that have kind of created whatever whatever hidden unfelt unseen tensions are there the question also then becomes, well, then, then how do you work with it? How do you be with it? I always like to kind of acknowledge that you're the product of your, of your biography, which is the story. But you're also the product of the biology. 
as to how those how those experiences live on the inside. And that's where much of the work of, of healing happens. And again, more on that later. So being aware of your wounds is enormously helpful. When you become aware of, of, of your wounds, of your gifts, it brings you so much more consciousness when you move into and in, through the world, particularly when it comes into relationships. And here, being aware of the wound in others is integral, <laughs> integral to happiness. I'm reminded of a, of a couple that I, I knew pretty well. She was free-spirited, happy-go-lucky, um, artistic, a dancer, and he was very responsible and focused. He was kind of like your classic uh, Eagle Scout. He just wanted to do right you know, uh, both really, really, really wonderful people. And when they met each other, incredible attraction. She kept him open and alive and expansive and opened doorways to him that he never would have walked through alone. And, and he provided some stability for her. And that was a really, really wonderful thing. They, they really had a, had a really wonderful time. They drew their lives together. And then as sometimes happen is the attraction becomes the complaint. So her open heartedness, her, her love of life, her, her easy, open spaciousness became a complaint. She's flaky and she's undependable. And for him, his steadiness, his, his responsibility, the complaint became he's, he's stiff and he's controlling. Inevitably, this is part of what happens. And so how do you work with that? If we don't acknowledge and name that, the polarization happens and it gets more and more locked in. And we realize that we forget that what we are attracted to becomes the major complaint. And so beginning to kind of unravel this a little bit, they began to explore through some facilitation a little bit around their wounding. And as it turns out, she had a very, very controlling mother. Her mother was, was super anxious. She was super depressed. And she felt utterly closed down and suffocated and wounded by, by her, her controlling mother. Her strategy was to get the heck out of there and embrace this kind of open, open, quasi joyous exploration of life with, uh, with no restrictions. And for him, he had an alcoholic father. And his father was utterly undependable, utterly erratic, the, the, the exact opposite of what he would have wanted for a, a role model. His resolution was to also get out of there as soon as he could too, but he focused on creating order in his life, creating a sense of responsibility out of his determination not to be his father. As they both articulated the wounds, it was fascinating to see how their whole countenance shifted. How they, they got weepy when they really felt on a deeper and deeper level how their partner was acting out of acting out of that wound. And that became very much a part of their process when whenever the the complaint would arise would be to contemplate kind of the wound of the other. And of course, much more to explore around expressing needs and being on for each other's happiness and so forth. But it was a pivotal point in their relationship. I think most of us carry some form of an imprint from our parents 
um, sometimes not always positive. And it's, it's a really interesting reflection. I remember someone way, way back said, took me through a little visualization. I'll just offer it for you now if you like. This is really, really short. If you like, you can close your eyes. And you might take three slow, deep breaths. And if you would, take a few moments to imagine your parents or your primary caretakers at about age 13. Can you imagine them maybe kind of gawky, unsure of themselves, not knowing where to turn in life? Can you sense or imagine their, their woundedness at that age? And just sense how your heart responds. And if you'd like, you can deepen your breath. You know, there's a, having been part of long, long meditation retreats for many, many years and supporting people in retreats, looking out into a sea of a hundred and hundred and so people all with their eyes closed and everyone looking so serene. It's so, it's so clear to me that every single person, they may look calm on the outside is fighting some inner battle and we're all fighting some inner battle. So how do we work with the wounds? in relationships. One is to remember them, to remember that we're all acting out of some form of self-preservation, some form of self-protection, to different degrees of skillfulness. Another is to, to explore gratitude for how, how we have been affected by the wounds of others. Tony Robbins tells this beautiful story of his mother who was very, very erratic and um, very, very unstable. And he realized at some point how grateful he was to his mother, how that experience with his mother helped him to realize that he could, he could, he could help people in their lives. Other one shared, uh, someone else shared how because of his father's unreliability, he resolved to become, one, some, to become someone trustworthy in life. I don't want to oversimplify this process because those wounds are often related to some degree with some kind of trauma. And when, we, when I think of trauma, I think of fear and helplessness. There is little trauma, there's big trauma, but trauma is trauma. It's, it's that sense of fear and helplessness when the body shuts down and there's no question in my mind that those that the wounds in life are searing, absolutely searing. And when you begin a process, say through meditation, you inevitably start this deconstruction process of your narrative. As you release more and more tension over time, what happens is you become more and more aware of the witness, more and more of your capacity to observe without judgment, but the wounds become a little bit more present, a little bit more available. And it takes time. And if you are feeling trauma from your past, the good news is there are some amazing resources out there that can be helpful. So if you find yourself turning toward the wound, turning to investigate it, and it feels like it's too much, explore some of the strategies for working with trauma and explore or consider finding someone who can, who can be a support for you in that, in that unraveling. In essence, when it comes to our wounds, it's about learning how to turn toward the discomfort and you know, getting comfortable with discomfort. But the upside, 
as we embrace our woundedness is there can be incredible gifts that come forward. I always like to say that the, the worst teachers are the ones who are the most gifted at what they do. If you're interested in learning yoga, do not go to a yoga teacher who is naturally flexible. You want to find a yoga teacher who really understands what it's like to feel tight and stuck and has developed all the strategies and skills on how to loosen up. The people who struggle the most are the absolutely the best teachers. There's no question about it whatsoever. When it comes to awakening, whatever that means to you, enlightenment, one of the things that many, many traditions say is that in that moment of awakening, in the moment of realization, in the moment of recognizing who and what you truly are beyond the, beyond the story, beyond the narrative, the first thing you do spontaneously is you bow down to your obstacles. That you, 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 you bow down, you offer pranams to, to the hardest, deepest challenges you've experienced. Because there's this instant recognition that it was the challenges that opened the door. This is really easy to say, <laughs> not so easy to do. But this is where forgiveness comes into our practice. As David White said, forgiveness is a heartache and difficult to achieve because strangely, the act of forgiveness not only refuses to eliminate the original wound, but actually draws us closer to its source. To approach forgiveness is to close in on the nature of the hurt itself, the only remedy being, as we approach its raw center, to reimagine our relationship to it. Wow. Wow. That when you explore forgiveness, it draws you closer to the original wound, to the rawness of the experience. And the only remedy is to reimagine your relationship to it. A friend of mine, first born out of a bunch of kids, told me about how <clears throat> when he was a kid, he had some eye, co eye coordination issues and it made him bad at sports. And because of that, at that age, being a kid, it was, it was searing to him that he wasn't good at sports. And what happened was he found other ways to fit in. And he became more of an integrator. He, he learned how to be funny, how to, how to tell stories, how to, how to create group harmony. You know, he got, he got praised in his family for, for being the one who could kind of pull everyone together. He learned how to be charming. And now his superpower is working with teams to help them achieve what they can't imagine. His superpower is taking a bunch of people pulling them together and getting a, a sense of a vision of what they can do and a strategy to make it happen. My story, I think, is, is similar to many's, to, to many people. I kind of felt invisible in my upbringing. I think my wound was around feeling invisible, not feeling like I belonged. That started me off on a path. And part of my journey has been around helping other people feel visible to themselves and to feel more visible to each other. Someone I know who felt deeply unsupported as a child, they realized that they had a skill in sensing who needed help. And they realized that they had a whole vocabulary, a whole set of experiences to empathically connect with people who weren't feeling supported. Someone I know well grew up the, the youngest of five kids, completely lost 
in a large family, kind of dismissed because she was always the, you know, the youngest, the most immature, with a deep, deep wound around not feeling seen, not feeling heard. She went on to become a dancer, uh, an actress, and to lead others into just the joy of, of self-expression. And what I found is with, in conversations with people around their wounds, the wound is always there. It's still there. I still find myself looking for evidence that I'm invisible, even though I'm 6'5 and do everything I do. <laughs> people who feel unseen, they are just unseen waiting to happen. But it's about how we hold our wounds. And so the question becomes, whenever you experience anything in your life that's between you and feeling happy or feeling peaceful, is it possible to turn toward that feeling? And to ask yourself, what is this teaching me right now? What, am, what can I learn about this, this experience? We're so run by our negativity bias. We're so run by the desire for, for self-protection and self-preservation. But when we really want to wake up, those wounds can become doorways. Each one of those points of discomfort can be a doorway to, to opening. Sometimes when people present me with a problem, I'll ask, well, what could be good about this? And it's sort of like this stunned reaction. But it's a really powerful question. What could be good about this, this clench inside or this, this spasm of self-protection or this play of judgment? Again, when you, when you look... When you sense your wounds, there are kind of two ways to do it. One is to look at what you do really, really well. And then to sense, was that in some way compensating for some wound? I know a lot of successful people on the planet who are haunted by their wounds. And the question becomes, are the skills that you develop for getting through life, are they driven by your wounds? Or are they a gift of your wounds? Have you made peace with those wounds? And I find, again, this metaphor of rain, the practice of rain, to be so helpful anytime you encounter anything that speaks of some inner wound or some, some form of something's not right or something's wrong with me. Can you recognize it? Can you name it? Can you allow it? And if you can't, that's okay. And maybe another time. But to turn toward it, to investigate it, to explore it somatically, to explore the beliefs that you hold about it, to sense where you can trace it back, to sense what it's like to hold it in loving presence, which is a skill each of us has to figure out in our own way, how to call on compassion, empathy, kindness, and then to be with anything that might have shifted is part of opening again to gratitude, opening again to how the wounds are an integral part of your awakening. Your awakening would not happen without the wounds. And so we're back to Japanese pottery, the parts of us that are broken the parts of us that are shattered. Is it possible to explore repairing the pottery, not in any way to disguise the wounds, but actually to bring gold to the wounds, to celebrate the wounds, and to create a piece of new art where the wounds are not only present, but they're integral to what has made us stronger than we were before. So with that, 
Let's take a few moments for a short yet brief meditation. If you'd like, you can close your eyes. You might slow down the breath. Notice where you feel the breath on the inside. And imagine, and if you wish, how the wounds and obstacles in your life have the possibility to unleash your gifts to the world. And if that doesn't feel true for you, you might inquire, what would you need to bring the wounds more fully into loving presence? into a sense of wholeness, into a sense of ease. As you're ready, you can deepen your breath. As you're ready, you can open your eyes. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And thank you as well for, uh, for bearing with this, whatever that reflection is on my eyes. And um, also just a little shout out to the little puppies under the bed. It's kind of a good metaphor for uh, coming into full aliveness. Thank you again. Many blessings. I look forward to being with you again.